Well, it isn't about collecting cards. It's about collecting relationships. You walk up to a group. Good point. They're having a conversation. You walk up and you, and you introduce yourself. Introduce yourself around. The first thing you should do is ask somebody else to talk. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Um, if you have, you know, referrals for them, I mean, uh, off the top of your head, on the spot, maybe not. But at least you're there listening. This is Mind Your Own Business with Mike and Matt, race car radio's podcast for business owners, entrepreneurs, and aspiring entrepreneurs. I'm David Hoffman, and your voices of reason are Mike Gansel and Matt Plosiak. If there's one thing a new business owner hears everywhere they go these days, it's, you gotta network. But what does that mean? How do you make the most of getting out there and meeting people? And how is networking different from marketing? Today, we're going to dive into those questions with a bona fide expert on the subject, Dave Bressler, the founder and owner of Network Network, a directed networking group here in New York City. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, David. Good morning, David. Good morning. And good morning, Mr. Bressler. Good morning. Good morning to you all. Um, our guest this morning is Mr. Dave Bressler of Network Network. That's network exclamation point, network exclamation point, no spaces. And... Uh, it, it, Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit about what, what is Network Network, or rather, Network Network. Yeah, well, we don't have to shout. So uh, Network Network is a structured face-to-face, business-to-business networking service. So I produce networking roundtables in Manhattan uh, every month, uh, and uh, we also have a couple of uh, network-wide events as well. So we have a cocktail party once a month, then we have a meeting called The Forum once a month, which is a meeting that's organized around some central theme. So there's a speaker or, or a panel. So Dave, how long have you been doing this? Uh, as a business, uh, a little over nine years. And what did you do before? Uh, I spent most of my career in IT. I spent 10 years at IBM selling mainframe computers to the big money center banks. I spent six years at Data General. And so when you were there, did you do networking? No. Not at all? No. I didn't start networking until early 90s when I was running an IT services business and one of my uh, actually my only salesman came went to a meeting and came back and said I think you should probably go to this so I started going to these networking meetings it was a small networking group really there were maybe 30 people all together and um, it was it was killer for me I I met with everybody though I met with every member at least once a year and I met with every guest almost without exception and I regularly did about a quarter of my revenue as a direct result of that networking experience. So it made me a true believer. I know it works. You just have to make the investment. People have, have gotten um, much more savvy lately about networking. There's a lot of people talking about networking, people writing books about it. And, and there, there are a lot of networking things out there. There's a lot of people throwing mixers, throwing groups. There's the whole BNI scene. There's all this stuff. What exactly, how does your networking system work and and how is it different from some of the other things that are out there? So the meetings are structured networking meetings that I I moderate. Our our process is we go twice around the room. The first time is a two-line introduction. And then we go around again. Everyone gets four minutes to discuss their business in greater detail. So however they define their marketplace, I always suggest that people be as narrowly focused as possible. Talk about one thing because... If people talk about more than one thing, they tend to lose the room. So it isn't that people aren't smart, it's that it gets confusing. And somebody brings a business problem to the group, we all get to ask questions to make sure we understand it, and then it's not about giving advice. It's an opportunity for everyone in the room to share an analogous experience so that the person who brings the problem gets to craft his or her own solution from everyone else's experiences. The the issue that I have often enough with many of these groups is that they are not structured. And so one person gets to speak a lot, one person gets to speak a little, and you never really get to understand who everyone is sitting around the table. And um, one of the things that I do enjoy about uh, Dave's groups is that it is structured. Everybody gets the same amount of time, relatively speaking. And that really makes a difference, gives everyone an opportunity in those groups to uh, portray themselves. I think you're right. I think more structure is better. And actually, recently I was at a group that I thought was one of the most impressive things I saw was 
after everyone said what they did and explained a little bit about the business, they went around the room and did thank yous. And every single person, and they were of almost 30, thanked someone or more than, some, more than one person in the group for something. And that I had not seen, and I've been to lots of groups. But um, and if you know, if you go, you know, after you go through twenty people and you're the twenty-first one, and you don't have a thank you, you feel a little strange. If the objective is to develop relationships, then thank yous just serve to bond the group. So, as Michael and I have said, you know, we've been in a lot of groups, and it somewhat fascinates me. I mean, I was, I was in one group, which I won't name, three years, gave several referrals out, brought a person into two clients and gave them the business, and I got no referrals at all. I mean, I'm just curious what, you, what your experience is. So uh, this is really all about relationships, and um, however much time you spend in the meeting, it's just a snapshot. It's a broad brush concepts overview. Uh, whether you get 45 seconds or whatever it is in BNI or four minutes in network network, it's not enough time. You have to meet one on one with people that you think you might have synergy with. Uh, because that's really where the magic happens. If you go spend an hour with somebody, um, at the end of that hour, you each have a much more profound understanding of what the other person does. And you've developed a relationship. So that when opportunities arise, they get recognized. And then they're willing to give them to you because now you're connected. It really is all about the relationship. Matt's question really gets to the heart of networking in a sense, which is give and take. And I think what Matt was really saying here is that he felt he was giving, but there was nothing coming back. So it's not necessarily reciprocal either. Um, you may be able to give leads to somebody who, can't, who doesn't see the people that you need to meet. Uh, so he or she can't give you leads back. So you can give leads to A, A can give leads to B, but not back to you. B can give leads to C, but not back to A. Uh, eventually, it should get uh, in a network, the network is a chain uh, or a matrix, uh, you should eventually get some referrals. Right, and you know, one, one of the mistakes I made initially when I started networking a few years ago is I kept thinking, oh, there's no one in this group that I could, you know, that will be my client, which I've discovered shortly that's wrong. What you really want is who can refer you multiple people, and those are the kind of networks you want to be in. That's, pre that's precisely it. Uh, you, you, you would like to get a half a dozen people who are good lead sources for you, Absolutely. who have N possible clients that they can refer to you. And then you need to, you need to make, make them your own. So now we get to the question about expectations. You know, um, many people join a networking group and then uh, within a short period of time, several months, they say, you know, this group isn't working out. Uh, why not? Well, I'm not getting any leads. I'm not getting any business. Well, what are you doing for your business? Are you doing any other marketing? Nope, it's just networking. And so what I often find is that that's like a, a ridiculous, almost a ridiculous expectation. If you're going to do marketing, it can't always just be one thing, and it certainly can't be networking. There's no guarantees. It, it can also take some time. It, it took me a year before I actually got any business at all. And then the dam broke, and I, I got, you know, on a, on a regular, habitual basis, uh, I got about a quarter of my revenue as a direct result of that networking service. And it, I believe it was a direct result of my having met with um, everybody that I possibly could. You have a stable group, same people meet once a month, twice a month, perhaps weekly. But the guests really kind of bring a new energy. And it, so if you're a new networker and you're in a group and you've been there for a bunch of months and there hasn't been any new guests, I think it's something to be wary of. Well, I, I don't disagree with that. There's also value in, in, uh, in familiarity. So you've, you've been in a group with uh, the same people or some of the same people for six months. You've become comfortable with them, and they've become comfortable with you. And it's really, um, I, what's, what's your comfort level with somebody? You know, if you're not comfortable with somebody, if you don't believe them or you don't like them, you're not going to give them any leads. For sure. You know, that, that was a revelation. 
um, that actually a conversation you and I had, um, Mike, about um, not selling with a proposal. Um, it, it ties back to this, where you, you said something to me that I really, that people don't buy your product because you give them a nice looking proposal. They buy your service, your product, because they like you and they want to do business with you. And the proposal gives them something that they can justify making that decision with. But they've already made the decision. That was a mind blowing piece of uh, oh, wisdom you gave me. Thank you. And it was, <clears throat> this, you know, um, and it, it ties in actually, I actually bought a book on your you recommendation, Matt. I bought, well, I buy a lot of books, but I bought a book on your recommendation, uh, Matthew, the uh, Never Eat Lunch Alone. Oh, did, did we get money on that, Austin? Uh, oh, well, I didn't buy the ebook because I actually like reading papers. <laughs> you, no, you, but oh, you should all you buy that kudos. from Audible. <laughs> Audible.com, audibletrial.com slash myob. Um, and the, uh, but anyway, I, and it's a, it's a terrific book, and, and it's um, something I hadn't thought about that put into this conversation was the, the idea of generosity and, and you know, going, going into a, a networking meeting with the idea of not what am I going to get from these people, but what can I give them? So I don't see that as really a problem. We are, by definition, by our nature, a generous species. There, there have st been studies done that show, you know how your mother told you you get more? from giving than you do from receiving? Yes. It's true. And, um, and, and the studies have been scientifically conducted and, and borne out. People get more pleasure from giving than they do from receiving. And it's innate because they've tested pre-verbal children. Huh. And they also get more pleasure from giving than they do from getting. I don't think well, they've met my children, but that's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think, I, you know, I love giving referrals to people. I just really like that. It's and if it helps, great. And if not, you know, on to the next. I, I, but I, think, I just, I just find it. I think you're right. I but think but coming into a group of that, that is such an interesting idea to me of coming in, you know, and just trying to genuinely being interested in people and wanting to meet them, wanting to talk to them, wanting to see how you can help each other, and not coming in. I mean, I think we've all been in, particularly when we're first starting these like horrible cocktail party networking things where <sighs> people just throw their business cards at you, I, I, you know, I, and you're, what are you supposed to do with that? Well, there are methods it. also for, you know, for operating in, you know, in, in multiple different kinds of networking venues. So um, maybe, Dave, maybe you can talk a little bit about that because, you know, in Manhattan, there, are, there you can go to, you know, five networking meetings a day or an, an evening and, you know, some of them, how, how, you know, let's, so you, you know, you go on meet up and you see a group that looks interesting and you go there once, how, how can you, and let's say you collect 15 cards. Well, it isn't about collecting cards. Uh, so it, it's about collecting relationships. So you walk up to a group. Good point. They're having a conversation. You walk up and you, and you introduce yourself, introduce yourself around. So, you know, I have some interesting techniques uh, when I walk into a, a big room and uh, things are going on. It's a networking, but it's a big networking event. And so I have several techniques. One is that I look for somebody who's actually on the edge of the room. Be and I go and I engage them in a conversation. Dance with a wallflower? Yeah, yeah kind yeah. of. I I've and, done that and also. Actually, actually uh, Matt, uh, I won't mention names, but I met one of our clients just that way. Uh -huh. And... Um, so I would go to him, and I went to this fellow who's standing on the edge of the room, and I started a conversation. And I deliberately did that because he was on the edge of the room. He felt isolated. I felt isolated. I figured, hey, you know, let's talk. That was one technique. I have another technique, and that is I look, th this is, uh, I look for, I look in the eyes of people in the room. And if I see what I'll call, quote unquote, the sparkle in their eye. It basically tells me that they're there willing to be engaged. And, they're, and so I'll make eye contact with that person, and I just will then go and engage. Now, interestingly enough, what happens is that as soon as I do that, all of a sudden, other people start to engage around. And then, then, then you have a choice. You, you can decide for yourself whether that person that you made that initial uh, eye contact with is really as interesting as you expected, or the other people who now come as uh, attracted to this magnet that happens, you look into their eyes and have a conversation with them. So it's really some interesting techniques to, to go to the, the wallflower or go to somebody who's the most engaged. I, I've gone to a wallflower and I said, by the way, you're not allowed to stand here by yourself. <laughs> and, and immediately you, you 
you get them engaged. Well, let me, let me ask a question here, not for myself, because I think, you know, Mike, Dave, and I certainly were very gregarious, extroverted people. Matt, perhaps a little bit less so. But, a bit less. Um, but what would you say to somebody who is that wallflower, who is shy about meeting people? How do you get over that? How do you, you know, work with that? You know, it's always hard the first time. Um, it's like every time, if you're, if, you're, if you're swimming laps, it's hard to get into the pool every time. Once you do, it's, it becomes easy. Right. So I you think, just have to break the ice. You have to, be, you have to suck up your guts and walk it. up to somebody. And even though it's scary, or it can be, even if you are gregarious, it can be somewhat scary. You, you just throw yourself into it, and then, you know, once you've broken the ice, it's, it becomes easy. You just force yourself, you know, several times. And it, you're right, Dave, it becomes easier and, and easier. I mean, I was, I used to be very shy, shyer than I am now. <laughs> uh, and um, in my early 20s, and I got into sales and I realized, gee, I, you know, I can't be shy now. So, so, I, so I just I'm, forced myself. I'm gregarious and self-confident. And still, uh, I, certainly the first few times I did it, I was nervous. Sure. So coming back to if you're approaching somebody in the room, let's say the wallflower, and they're standing there, a great question to ask them is, is there anyone in the room that you'd like to meet? And they say, yeah, I want to meet that person over there. You say, great, let's go over together and meet that person. That, I, I, I that's actually, a great way to break the ice. I actually did that once. There were, um, it, it was a young woman, and she was kind of standing by herself, and uh, and she said she she, when I, when I approached her, she said she was nervous about this. I said, come on, I'll show you how to do it. And I grabbed her by the hand. I dragged her over to a group of people. And I just interjected myself into the group. And, of course, she was along for the ride. And she realized very quickly that it wasn't so hard to do. And people were actually interested in having a conversation with her. So, you know, some of it is a fear of the unknown. And once you've broken that ice, you find that the unknown is really known after all. More about how to make networking work for you after this important message. Hey, welcome fans of auditory entertainment. I'm Austin, Senior Vice President of Applied Transduction and Crossfading, here at the Doppler Effect Observation Facility at our Citizen Racetrack. We couldn't be more thrilled to tell you that Mind Your Own Business is being sponsored by Audible, the world's biggest and best provider of audiobooks. And guess what? You can get a free audiobook by signing up for a no-obligation 30-day trial by going to audibletrial.com slash M-Y-O-B. You can choose from any one of their amazing collection of audiobooks. Ah, looks like we're getting a call from Mike on the book recommendation line. Mike, is that you? Yes. Good morning. How are you today? I'm good. Uh, is it true that you really have a book you're going to recommend to us today? Yes, I really do. You remember we did a, an episode on abundance versus scarcity. And uh, I wanted to recommend this book called Abundance. It's The Future is Better Than You Think by Stephen Kotler and by Peter uh, Diamandis. So what I liked about this book, Abundance, is it really gives a salesperson a true perspective on what the next opportunity is like. I think it's a great inspirational book. I would highly recommend it for every salesperson. Put it on their shelf. Great. Thanks, Mike. And again, that book was Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think by Stephen Cutler and Peter Diamandis. This is just one of an amazing collection of audiobooks that you can choose from. Just go to audibletrial.com slash M-Y-O-B to sign up today for a 30-day trial membership. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash M-Y-O-B. And now, back to Mind Your Own Business with Mike and Matt, and our guest, Dave Bressler. Dave, I have a question. Since I'm the numbers guy, um, is there any, like, metrics that someone can use to gauge how they're doing, in, you know, networking within a group or several groups or... You know, people network for, for multiple different reasons. So some people, and maybe many network to generate more business. But we've had people in the network who network for resources. So they're not looking for business. They have enough business as it is. What they need is resources for their clients. And so they're just stockpiling 
those resources, whatever they might be. So I, I don't know. I mean, the metric has to be a personal metric. What's your objective when you move, go into a networking situation uh, and then measure it against that? Now the metrics go against your expectations. I mean, you know, realistically, if you spend $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 a year on networking, you obviously want a return. What what is what is that? Is it? But what's the time frame that you require well, that res, that return in? Well, if um, you've made an investment, let's say you make an investment of two thousand dollars for the year. At the end of the year, you look and you say, "What have I gotten out of this?" Now, l let's talk about metrics. Metrics could be how many new people have you met, right? That okay. How many new referral sources have you met? How many clients? Have you gathered either directly or indirectly? Um, how much did you enjoy it? So there are a variety of different metrics. Everybody has different expectations. Um, the one expectation that I believe you cannot have is I have to get business out of my network. I have to get well, it. And, and also, uh, I have to get business out of, a net, out of the network in a very specific time frame because it's basically an, a random and unpredictable kind of a business. So you just have to keep on keeping on. Eventually, it does happen. How do you evaluate? So you've been, you choose a group that seems like it might be promising. You start going, you start attending the meetings. Perhaps you pay a membership fee, whatever it is. How do you, you know, you're a few months in, you haven't really made what you feel are valuable connections, whatever those personal metrics are. How do you evaluate whether you should be pushing through and continuing on or moving on to something else? So I'm going to respond to that, maybe not directly, but talk about uh, an approach to networking that typically there are two approaches that I think to simplify. One is to go a mile wide and an inch deep. The other is to go an inch wide and a mile deep. So it really comes down to what is your perspective in terms of making that evaluation? If indeed you want to go a mile wide and an inch deep, well, that basically is, is you know, how many, that's really comes down to how many people do you want to meet? The quantity, not quality. Inch wide, mile deep is how many good relationships did I uh, put together in that period of time? And that's more of the relationship. So again, there is, uh, if there were 10 people in the group or 20 people in the group over this period of time, did I actually have a one-to-one -one conversation with each one of those people? Did I speak to them on a regular basis? It occurs to me that I, I want to be in rooms full that are people who, who I admire, who, who are in a position where I would like to be, who are dealing with the size, the number, the kind of clients that I would want to have. You know, if I, if I go to a group, those are, those are two, two, not necessarily the same thing. Those are, could be different for things. sure. But like, for instance, I, I was guesting at a networking group for a while and I decided not to join because I realized that the people there were talking about the connections they made in the group and the, and the, the clients and the, the, the contracts that they secured. And it was all at a much sort of smaller price point than the kind of contracts I'm looking to secure. And so it seemed to me that this is not the right group for me to be in because it's not, they're not playing the same game that I'm trying to play. Um, and so I want to get in a group in which the people are, and I've been lucky to find some, where the people are kind of playing in the same sort of ballpark. Because if you're not, they're not going to have referrals. Anyway, I'm curious what you think of that as a, as a way to evaluate a group. So, so I, I mean, I don't have a specific comment. I think, you're, I think, that's, I think that's accurate. Um, I, I got the largest piece of business um, that, uh, that I ever got from networking from a, a totally unlikely source. So, you, you know, going back to Mike's a mile wide and an inch deep or, or an inch wide and a mile deep, um, I, those are not mutually exclusive. And so you can meet with as many people as, as you have time for, and you can get fairly deep with most of them. I, I, you, it, it really, you, you really have to be top of mind in order to get a referral. So if you meet, if you meet, if you're an inch deep and a mile wide, unless you have a, a an extraordinarily compelling product or service, nothing is ever going to happen. That's from that. correct. And that, that's typically where you get the business card yeah, thrown that, at you. That's been my experience. Yeah. But you also, but you shouldn't actually limit it to people that you think you specifically have synergy with because you can get leads from almost anywhere, from any source. And as long as you've kept yourself top of mind and you have a compelling message, 
if something pops up in their in their world, they're going to think of you. So here here are some things that I think uh, kind of are mistakes people make in uh, when they present themselves in a networking group. Sometimes they're just overly aggressive. You know, they just you know have to re- you know they 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 just uh, I don't know have to impress you, and they impress you with you know too much of their bio and too much of their success. So you got to kind of get a little push a little pushy. You, I don't know. I just get turned off a little bit on a personal if, level. If you're trying to establish relationships and you want people to like you, this is not the best way to do it. Right. The other thing, though, is when you make a referral, you have to really be, uh, it's a, it has to be a good referral. You can't just refer anyone just because you need to make a referral. You really have to think that and make it a good one it, that has some real possibilities that you believe that there's some real synergy, not just throw a referral at someone. Several times I've been invited to guest at BNI groups, and that's been the issue I've had, and really one of the reasons I've always declined to join that system. You are expected to refer yeah, people around this table to your contacts. And I, it's like, well, I don't know how good your work is. Just because we happen to join the same BNI group doesn't mean that I want to put my neck out. And so that that felt, that rang false to me, and wh- that's why I've not really bought into that system. But my, my perspective is, uh, and I don't track referrals, My perspective is you will give a referral if, A, you have a real referral to give, B, if you're not being forced to give referrals, B, you'll give referrals to people that you like and trust, uh, and uh, C, you'll give referrals to people that you respect. Uh, And and so if you don't don't like and respect somebody, you're not going to give them a referral, even if you have the perfect piece of business for them. David asked earlier, um, what makes me different? So when I put this together early 2000, late, actually it was late 2009, um, my attitude was I want all the members to be substantial people. And by that, I mean high integrity pays it forward. And I wanted to like them all. Um, And, you know, I'm pretty much there. It's a very consistent demographic, irrespective of gender, race, ethnic background, or any other, any other consideration. It tends to be a very con- consistent demographic. And when I started, all the, all the people came from me. I mean, I'd been collecting people for a long time in New York. And so I had a fair number of people who had seen me in a networking situation and were willing to come to meetings. Uh, but probably over the last seven years, it's transitioned to a point where, and this has been now going on for a while, uh, where all of my new prospects come from current members. And and this is really the way I, I, I prefer it. They know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people just like them. So let's say you're in three or four network groups. You know, I know this banker, I know that banker, I know this account, I know that account. So I have to refer someone. Obviously, you want to make the the, the best match, but it's saying, gee, I, I haven't sent anyone to, to this person in a while, and I know they do a good job, but I know this person does a good job. I mean, how do you, what, I, what well, do you I, do? Of course you have to only give referrals to people that you're comfortable with. Um, right. If somebody asks for, uh, for a referral, I will try and give multiple referrals. I'll send him two or three um, people that I think might be good for him or her, and and let them vet them. Because I may think somebody is terrific and they may not like them or they may not be comfortable with them. So I, I, I often give them, if I can, I'll give them several choices and let them choose. So that would come down to the referral etiquette. So uh, if I'm gonna make a referral, sometimes I want to put some detail about the person I'm referring in the email that I'll do a virtual introduction. Oh, oh absolutely, I, I try and do that as well. Uh, and so what happens here is that you know, how do you, well, where do you find something? Well, if that person has a website or if that person has a LinkedIn summary, but often enough, you find that they don't have a two, two sentences that just basically describes what they do. But if you don't know them well enough to be able to describe them in some form or fashion, you probably shouldn't be making a recommendation to them or a referral to them I anyway. Know, I don't know if I agree with that. I think that it's, it's my, if I want you, Dave, to make a referral for me, I should make it easy for you to do that. And I should have some place very simple for you to find two sentences about me that you can just cut and paste and plug into that virtual introduction. I think the onus is on me. So if I want referrals, then I have to have that. 
and make it easy for the guy or the person who's referring you. But being prepared, I think what you're getting to, and I think that's interesting, is the other step of this of successful networking is, you know, you're, you're finding you're in the right group, you're being gregarious, you're being generous, you're, you're engaging people in conversation. When it comes to the point where they say, okay, so what do you do? You have to have a good story to tell you, them. Exactly. And, and, and you have to be prepared con- for that moment. That, you have right. to have and your elevator pitch ready. Exactly. You're in control of that. You basically, you want people to say what you want them to say. Now, obviously, people will say whatever they want to say, but at least you can give them something that portrays what you want to be said about yourself. And a lot of people just don't realize that. And I think that's a key to getting good referrals is telling somebody how they should introduce you. Well, I think in, in networking as in all things, really, um, Mike, Matt, Dave, I think really you guys should just mind your own business. Uh, yes, Dave, I think you should mind your networking business by yourself. <laughs> Dave, I think you should mind network, network. Network, network. <laughs> okay, it's a wrap. Sound like Phil Schaap. <laughs> okay. Thanks for listening to Mind Your Own Business with Mike and Matt. My co-hosts, as always, are Mike Ganzel and Matt Plosiak of Voice of Reason Consulting, voiceofreasonconsulting.com. I'm David Hoffman, and I produced today's show. It was edited by Paul Malone and recorded and mixed by Austin Colon. You can learn more about our business at citizenracecar.com. Special thanks to Boucher and Company for hosting us for today's recording session. You can learn all about the wonderful work they do in social media marketing at B-O-U-C-H-E-R-C-O dot com. Today's Mind Your Own Business was brought to you by Audible, where you can get the free audiobook of your choice by signing up for a no-cost 30-day membership at audibletrial.com slash M-Y-O-B. That's audibletrial.com slash M-Y-O-B. Never miss an episode of Mind Your Own Business by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and many of your other favorite podcasting apps. Find those links at racecarradio.com slash mindyourownbusiness. You can also follow us on social media at MYOB Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and now Instagram. Mind Your Own Business with Mike and Matt is a production of Racecar Radio, www.racecarradio.com.